focuses on actonucleotidases. Uh, these are an emerging novel target for drug discovery, especially uh, in the immuno-oncology area. Um, my talk would focus on uh, introducing the assay platform uh, under the brand name TransCreener assays, and then share some of the data that we have generated here at Bellbrook Lab. Um, so um, Citrix allows you to type your questions in the dialog box. There's a dialog box that says questions, so please do type your questions uh, and it would appear on our screen. And we'll address those questions at the end of this webinar. Um, but uh, please feel free to also send us your questions if you have via emails or phone if for some reason we are not able to address them today. Um, so uh, let's get started. OK. Uh, Transcleaner assays are a competitive immunoassay. And the assay itself relies upon proprietary antibodies uh, that can differentiate between nucleotides based on very subtle uh, differences. Now, um, for example, in this picture, you have uh, AMP antibody that can recognize uh, monophosphate over triphosphate or the cyclic version of the same nucleotide. Um, we also have antibodies um, that can recognize diphosphates, um, ADP or GDP, in the presence of ATP. So very small uh, differences uh, could be um, detected using these antibodies. Now, this is what makes the detection of the product possible in the presence of excess uh, substrate nucleotide. And when I say uh, excess substrate nucleotide, that means that initial under initial velocity conditions following michaelis menten parameters, you can detect the nucleotide. What makes this assay so unique? There are many assays out there uh, for AMP, G, uh, GMP detection. What makes our assay very unique is the ability to detect them directly. So the antibody directly goes and binds to the invariant product formed from uh, any enzyme reaction, um, phosphodiesterases, ligases, um, uh, or in to today's topic, actonucleotidases, any enzyme product that produces AMP, the antibody goes and binds directly to that as opposed to the coupled assay methods. So in coupled assay method, you add two or more enzymes, and you convert the AMP that's formed from enzyme reaction into a, a intermediate, and then you add another reporter enzyme that converts it into a signal. And the drawback with such a convoluted method is that any one of these three enzymes could be inhibiting your compound library. So you always have to go back and deconvolute um, the, the, the inhibitors that you get from a hit. And when you're talking about a million compound library, it's a lot of deconvolution to do. So that's one of the biggest drawbacks of coupled assay methods. Um, the assay itself is extremely simple to run. And people who have uh, used your assay in the past know that it's also very flexible. It's not we give the flexibility to the customer to design the enzyme reaction and the detection mixture as per their uh, preference. So step one is to run enzyme reaction. We say about 10 microliters, but you could do it at 15. And then add in the second step the AMP detection mixture. Uh, the detection mixture, as you can uh, see in this graphic, comprises of a monoclonal antibody against AMP and what we call as the tracer molecule. The tracer is nothing but AMP that's conjugated to a fluorophore. Now, the assay is available in two detection formats. One is fluorescent polarization and TR-FRET. And the primary uh, uh, goal to introduce it into different formats was to overcome uh, instrumentation barrier. So most instruments can read, uh, they are multi-mode readers, and they can read FP, TR-FRET, FI, luminescence, and absorbance. But they, they do one better over the other. They have, uh, you know, one is more one is preferred, one version is preferred, and so we wanted to overcome the instrumentation barrier. Uh, the other, um, as we uh, started selling reagents, we realized that uh, people tend to like one format over the other. Now, the principle of the assay for the two methods is very, very simple. So uh, the antibody and the tracer are in close proximity to each other, are together or bonded together. Now, uh, the tracer now is uh, rotating very little or tumbling little because it's um, binding to the antibody. This is a big bulky molecule and therefore it does not change the plane of polarization as um, 
light falls on it. Um, now, as the reaction produces AMP, the, uh, the tracer gets displaced and AMP goes and binds to the antibody as it has more affinity for the antibody. Now, this tracer molecule is really, really small and can tumble freely. And therefore, uh, it can change the plane of polarization. It can lower the polarization. So it is a negative assay. The TR FRET is very similar. We take the exact same antibody, but it's conjugated to a lanthanide, terbium in this case. And the fluorophore, there is a FRET between the tracer and the terbium molecule. Now, as the tracer gets displaced because of the distance increasing between them, the FRET uh, decreases. So these both are these both these formats are negative assays and either reduces the polarization or reduces the ratio. They perform very similarly though. Uh, I do have to mention the tracer that we choose in both these assays are far red tracer and uh, we use far red tracer because it's been shown that far red tracers uh, lower interference significantly, compound interferences. So, uh, so there are two advantages of using our assay. A, it is direct assay, and B, it uses far-red tracers, so it minimizes compound interference. Um, the other uh, use of our assay that makes it very unique is its ability to be also run in kinetic mode. Most assays cannot, if the coupled assays cannot be run in a kinetic mode as you have to uh, remove a certain reagent before add, uh, adding the next enzyme, next coupling enzyme. In our case, we can, without the stop reaction, you can just run the assay in kinetic mode and take readings at regular intervals. Uh, so this graph here, um, I did say it's a competitive immunoassay and the antibody uh, binds to AMP. This shows uh, titration of different nucleotides here like AMP and GMP. We call it the AMP-GMP antibody because the antibody has, very, uh, has almost similar affinities for both AMP and GMP detection. Um, and several fold uh, affinity selectivity over ATP, cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP. So it gives a very good selectivity almost. Um, you, you can see the selectivity um, in the table below. It's about 8,000 fold for AMP versus ATP and uh, 3,000 or even higher for um, cyclic GMP. So that just shows, shows that the assay is extremely sensitive and extremely selective for AMP or GMP. Now, um, I do want to mention that um, even though the sensitivity of the assay, as I said, is very, uh, you can make it even more sensitive by just fine-tuning the concentration of the antibody or the tracer that you would use in the assay. So you can uh, decrease the uh, antibody concentration in the FT assay and make it more sensitive. You might lose the assay window a little bit, but you could make it more sensitive. Now, here is an example of a standard curve run in both FT and TR FRET format. Uh, the table below gives the Z prime, um, and Z prime of 1 is considered ideal where there is absolutely no variation from well to well, which is very difficult to achieve in uh, real life. Um, but if you look at the table here, um, our Z primes are uh, at 10% conversion are pretty good. and um, for a 0.1 micromolar ATP to AMP conversion, it's about 0.8 at 30% conversion. Now, uh, the way we run our standard curve is to mimic an enzyme reaction. So what we do is we decrease the ATP concentration while increasing the AMP concentration, thereby maintaining the ratio to be the same. So that's kind of how we run um, or design our standard curves. And the purpose of standard curve is um, to convert the raw data that you get into the product formed, into AMP formed. And I will show you in just a bit, but just remember that all competitive binding assays are by nature nonlinear. It's not just transcreener assay. If you take any competitive binding assay, the response is going to be nonlinear. And one way to convert that into linearity would be to run a standard curve under exactly similar conditions and then interpolate your data. Um, your unknown values from the standard curve. And that's the purpose of running standard curve for our assay as well. Um, and let's take 10 micromolar uh, standard curve as an example. And if you look at 10% conversion, what that means is you have one micromolar AMP plus nine micromolar ATP. Um, so add, um, and then 
50% conversion would mean like 5 micromolar ATP and 5 micromolar AMP, you get the idea. So you can see that even at such low concentration or conversion, 5% or 1%, you still get a very good Z prime for both TRFRET and FPSA, more than 0 0.7. And the Z prime greater than 0.5, uh, according to the assay guidelines published by NIH, is considered to be really good for um, uh, biochemical screening. Okay, so moving on to the target, um, uh, CD39 and CD73 are two ectonucleotidases. They are very important in maintaining immune homeostasis. So ATP is the major metabolite uh, on which all life form depends. And uh, under normal conditions, ATP is localized in the intracellular compartment where the concentrations are millimolar ranges and publications show anywhere between 1 to 10 millimolar in, in, inside, in, in the intracellular compartment. Um, but the ATP concentration on the other hand in the extracellular milieu is only um, uh, in nanomolar amounts, 10 to 100 nanomolar uh, if you look at different publications. So these are negligible levels. Now. Um, when there is a danger signal, like um, from dying cells or damaged cells, the extracellular ATP concentration uh, starts increasing, and that's like a signal generated by dying and damaged cells. And it functions as an immunostimulatory signal that promotes uh, inflammation. Um, However, um, the other molecule here, uh, adenosine, in it, uh, the extracellular concentration of adenosine is maintained um, uh, uh, it's maintained uh, at the same level and it acts as an immunoregulatory signal that modulates different cellular comp components of the immune response, both innate and uh, adaptive. Now, therefore, the balance between ATP and adenosine is very, very crucial to maintain homeostasis. And these two uh, um, targets here, CD39 and CD73, uh, they, they work together in synergy in generating the extracellular adenosine by hydrolyzing ATP. So whenever there is a damage or, uh, um, or cells are dying, the ATP concentration increases and that gets broken down into adenosine. And just th that's the balance is therefore tilted towards immunosuppression in these microenvironments. Um, and adenosine can prevent activation, proliferation, uh, cytokine production, and cytotoxicity in T cells um, through the adrenergic receptor, uh, sorry, adenosine receptor. Um, so uh, we talked about uh, these ectoenzymes, specifically CD39 and CD73, but uh, there are several other ectoenzymes that act as these immunoswitches to maintain the immune homeostasis. Uh, one is the, the nucleotidase, CD39, which is what we're going to talk about today. It hydrolyzes very, um, primarily ATP, ADP, but it also um, is known to bind to other diphosphates like UDP to generate uh, AMP. That's the um, monophosphate that's produced at the end. That's the role of nucleotidases. There is ectonucleotide pyrophosphate. It's known as ENPP family, and um, they break down ATP to AMP and a pyrophosphate molecule. So these um, enzymes also are important as immune switches. Um, there is alkaline phosphatase family, and they degrade uh, all kinds of adenine nucleotides into pyrophosphate and release inorganic phosphate. So that's the final uh, product of these enzymes. And there is 5' prime nucleotidase family, uh, which is CD73, which takes the AMP that's produced by, by the nucleotidase and breaks that into adenosine. So these four uh, targets play a very important role as immune switch in converting ATP to ADP to AMP to adenosine and pyrophosphate. Now we're going to focus today on CD39 molecule, and it's the prototype uh, ENTPD1, as it's called, and was the first of the eight uh, nucleotidase enzymes to be cloned and sequenced. Um, CD39 has, um, uh, it, this family requires divalent cation, calcium, and magnesium for its activity, and it can bind to uh, triphosphate and diphosphate um, and generate the monophosphate, as we talked about. Now the structure, it has about 510 amino acids and it has two transmembrane domains and a very small cytoplasmic domain. 
Um, it has a large extracellular hydrophobic domain that has the conserved regions in all the nucleotidase families called the apirase conserved regions. There are five domains there and ACR1 to ACR5 and these are very important uh, in the catalytic cycle and the binding site for the um, diphosphate and the triphosphate, the nucleotide. Um, this, uh, the enzyme is, or the target is expressed on activated lymphoid cells and it's also de uh, detected in endothelial tissue. Now, uh, CD39 is emerging as a very, very interesting drug target. There are so many review articles on this uh, uh, target and um, the one that came recently um, uh, uh, it's a very good review uh, that shows that CD39, we know, know that it's involved in immune regulation and vascular regulation, but it has also been implicated in several diseases like thrombotic diseases, in atherosclerosis, autoimmune, diabetes, cancer, um, and these two molecules, CD39 and CD73, are involved in tumor immunity. Um, it has been shown that the CD39 expression gets eleva elevated in many, many cancers. Therefore, targeting these two would be, uh, therefore, a very good strategy for cancer immunotherapy. Now, um, now I borrowed this uh, image from Innate Pharma's website. Um, it, it, it's a, they have a different approach for targeting CD39, but it gives a very good um, uh, idea of uh, what uh, happens in 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 uh, in a, a situation such as this. So, under normal, as I mentioned, under normal physiological conditions, ATP concentration in extracellular environment is in uh, nanomolar amounts, and in intracellular environment is millimolar amounts. Now, what happens is in solid tumors. ATP is abundantly released in the extracellular environment and the ATP concentration changes from nanomolar to micromolar amount, um, which is a concentration like almost 1,000 times greater than its healthy tissue. Now, uh, probably this happens due to cell death inside the tumor core or due to hy hypoxic stress or other um, pro-inflammatory signals. Um, but the ATP is then um, sent outside into the extracellular environment. Uh, it has also been shown that in tumors, the CD uh, there is elevated level of expression of both CD39 and CD73. Now, what happens is as ATP gets broken down into adenosine, um, uh, ATP is converted into AMP, AMP into adenosine. It triggers the immunosuppression, um, immunosuppressive signals, which helps the tumor thrive and spread. Now. When you when you start inhibiting the CD39, I mean, of course, it shows here an antibody-based approach because that's what innate pharma does. But if you have small molecule inhibitors against CD39, what it does is it does not it keeps the adenosine concentration lower and thereby does not create the immunosuppressive signal, and um, um, and uh, the tumor starts. Bleeding. So um, that, that's why it's a very good uh, target to focus on or look for inhibitors for um, CD39. So uh, with that, uh, having said, I'm going to show you how we used, uh, what conditions we used and how we developed our assay using transcreener AMP2, GMP2 assay for CD39. Um, so the buffer based on like a lot of literature search and as I said, it's a divalent, it requires both calcium and magnesium. So we uh, threw in 10 millimolar calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, tris and bridge and uh, tried using uh, both ATP and ADP as a substrate and I went for slightly higher concentration, 100 micromolar uh, super saturating conditions. Um, I used pH 7.5, although um, for ADP it's more, um, uh, the, paper, the literature, the publications uh, show that it's more about you know, around 8, pH 8 for ADP and more around pH 7, so I kind of wanted something intermediary and that's the conditions we ch chose with our assay. So to, um, to develop our uh, transcreener assay, the first step would be to optimize the antibody concentration. And um, y you could use uh, the technical manual provides a great, an equation, a linear equation, and it's a great starting point. But sometimes when you have a new substrate like ADP that 
uh, you know, that is not there, you, what you do is you just run an antibody titration. So here in the x-axis shows a serial titration of antibody and you measure the polarization units. And you pick the concentration, EC85 concentration, where it just starts coming down right over here. You pick that concentration as the most optimal concentration. And when I say most optimal concentration, I mean that at 85%, uh, most of the antibody is bound to the tracer. So that gives you a very good compromise for a good assay window as well as uh, sensitivity. So if you start going, like we were talking about making it more sensitive, so if you go down the antibody concentration, you can make the assay even more sensitive, but you will, uh, the assay window will decrease a little bit. So you just have to keep that in mind. You can fine tune the assay according to what your needs are. So the second step was to uh, run a titration of CD39, uh, uh, the, uh, the enzyme, to see uh, what kind of response I would get. And we got the enzyme uh, from R&D system. Here is the information on the enzyme. And uh, the enzyme was, uh, publication says it uses both ATP and ADP, uh, uh, you know, with similar, it has similar affinity. But I did see that there was a preference for ADP over ATP. And I repeated it several times, and uh, that's kind of what we have been seeing. Um, so this is the curve for ATP. It gives a better assay window than ADP. But when we convert it, as I said, the assay itself is nonlinear. So we run a standard curve uh, under very similar conditions and then interpolate the data to get a linear response, as is shown here. And as you can see, um, uh, it's pretty linear for both ATP and ADP, but it, uh, the assay um, uh, or the enzyme preferred ADP as a substrate produces more AMP from ADP. Now, um, uh, this graph just shows titration of ATP and ADP uh, to just determine if I was using optimal concentration. I've been using for my assay about 100 micromolar, <coughs> excuse me, but if you blow up this region here uh, and enlarge it, you see that the assay saturates for ATP, it saturates about uh, two mi uh, micromolar, I would say, which is what the, um, in the extracellular ATP concentration is in nanomolar range when we, um, in, in normal healthy cells. It's just when, the, when, when in, in damaged cells, it goes up to micromolar amounts. So it makes sense that um, about two micromolar is, it's, a, it's saturating for the enzyme. And for ADP, it was slightly higher. It was about 5 to uh, 7 micromolar for, for it to reach the saturation, to reach the plateau. Uh, so that was something interesting to note. Um, th this graph here shows, uh, you know, we were, we were trying to develop conditions for a high throughput screening assay, so we wanted to run uh, the enzyme reaction. Here is uh, 12, a replicate of 12 wells with the enzyme with either ATP or ADP and just the buffer itself and uh, got SD prime of 0 0.72. That was good enough. And then um, looked at two inhibitors. So uh, polyoxometallates, uh, these are uh, uh, inorganic metal clusters that have been shown to have antiviral, anti-cancer, uh, antibacterial e effects. Now this POM1, uh, which is basically sodium polytungstate, uh, is a known inhibitor of ectonucleotidases. Uh, it d uh, displays minor selectivity for um, isoforms 1 and 2 over 3. Um, and this compound here, PSB069, uh, is a non-selective CD39 uh, inhibitor. And this compound inhibits um, 1, 2, and 3 with similar potencies. So, um, uh, that's what this compound here is. And we could show a very good dose response curve, agrees very well with the published uh, literature value, the IC50 here um, shown in the SPSA. This graph um, uh, or this um, table here is borrowed from a publication uh, uh, that came out in 2015. And they had, this group has also used transcreener, they used our transcreener AMP2 assay to um, and uh, made a bunch of compounds. Twelve of these compounds uh, use polyoxotungstate uh, as the clusters and four other use rhenium as the clusters. And uh, they tried to um, d uh, get IC50 or KI values for 
isoform 1, 2, 3, and 4, um, well, it's not very selective for uh, so 3 and 8. It's not very selective for 8, as you can see. But even within 1, 2, and 3, there were some compounds that showed good selectivity, like number 6 you know, was not a good inhibitor, like, so you kind of see uh, selectivity towards two and three. So that was good to see that uh, 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 some other people have also used our assay and got really good results. So uh, we wanted to next proceed to, uh, uh, to a pilot screen, and we ran a LOPAC uh, library, which has about uh, 1280 uh, bioactive compounds. Uh, the controls here shown in green are just the uh, enzyme itself without the substrate. Uh, substrate here is ATP um, without the substrate. And the blue triangles uh, is enzyme with ATP. Um, and um, most of the compounds are, and the HIT criteria was three plus or minus three standard deep. And um, as you can see, we identified a bunch of uh, compounds um, that were possible inhibitors, and one interesting compound here, um, which lowered the polarization value. So I uh, went back and looked at what these compounds were, and it wasn't very surprising that most of these were uh, ATPase inhibitors uh, like these, and some were nuclease inhibitors, so it, it just makes sense. It was just some of these compounds uh, are sirtuin inhibitor and um, uh, the RAR agonist, we want to follow up with those. And uh, the one that, uh, that showed uh, this lower MP value was actually an estrogen receptive modulator. So we are in the process of getting all these compounds and running dose response curves currently. So that's where that uh, part of the um, project is. Uh, meanwhile, we wanted to also use our TRFET assay to see if we were getting uh, similar results with the TRFET assay. So uh, again, the same set of uh, experiments were done using TRFET format. Uh, here is ATP, ADP uh, titration, um, uh, using ATP as a substrate or ADP as a substrate. And again, when I converted it into the product forms, once again, I saw that ADP was uh, producing more AMP than ATP. Uh, ATP. So uh, not only that it repeated um, uh, over, you know, with FPSA, I repeated it several times to make sure that I was, uh, because the publications uh, do suggest that they use both ATP and ADP with equal affinity, which is not what we were seeing. Um, but it also uh, reproduced in the TRFET assay. So that was, that gave us some, uh, that gives us more confidence in our data. Um, shown here is a Z prime for TRFET assay, uh, again uh, using either ATP or ADP as a substrate, and uh, here is the control. So we get a good Z prime. Uh, so the assay was all ready to do a high throughput screening. So uh, what we did was we um, took just five random plates from uh, Cambridge Library, so 1,600 compounds from the Cambridge Diversity Library, and I ran a screen. Uh, again, the HIT criteria was three times standard deeds, and we did find um, nine compounds. You know, they're not uh, a big hits, um, but we do see that they were above the three standard deeds line. So we are getting these compounds in and going to be testing them to uh, see what they are. So that's where um, uh, our interest is right now. But um, in conclusion, I wanted to say uh, transcreener AMP2, GMP2 assay, and uh, the asterisk 2 just means that it's the second generation assay. It has monoclonal, it's based on with, uh, using a monoclonal antibody that's even more sensitive. And um, uh, it allows direct detection of AMP and GMP. The assay has really good selectivity for AMP and GMP over any of the substrates, ATP, ADP, cyclic AMP, and cyclic GMP. Extremely sensitive and flexible. Uh, you can um, uh, run it in kinetic mode. You can run it as a stop reaction. Um, and you can fine tune the assay to suit your needs. So you can run it as 10 plus 10 or 15 plus 5 or 18 plus 2, I mean, however you want. So that's kind of the uh, ability, uh, the uniqueness of our assay. We um, give the user the flexibility to use it the way they want to design their experiment. Um, the high selectivity for AMP and GMP allows us to use it for diverse enzymes. Any enzyme class, actually, that produces AMP um, 
uh, today's uh, webinar uh, was uh, showing the case study ENT PD1 or uh, CD39, but we could also use it with other enzyme class. Um, the IC50 values that were obtained for two uh, tool compounds compares very well with the published values. And we are um, we ran the LOPAC and the Cambridge Library pilot screen, have some hits that are currently being confirmed in a dose-response manner. Um, so that brings us to the end of my talk. And uh, here are a list of enzymes that we have been validated, not necessarily for the AMP, GMP assay, but you can look through. There are uh, targets that produce ADP, there are targets that produce GDP, or the methyl transferase targets that produces SAH as the, um, uh, as the product, invariant product. So we have, asked, we have validated all these targets. And should you have any interest in any of these targets, please do contact us and we'll provide you additional information. Uh, and here is the ordering information for our assay. And um, you have more information in our uh, website. And if you would need to order, um, uh, you can send us an email or technical questions to me at uh, mira.kumar at bellbrooklabs.com. Now that brings me to the end of this talk. And um, if you have any questions, I'll take that now.